How is everybody? Good. Good. All right. Are you looking forward to the new week? Yes, sir. I <laughs> enthusiasm. <laughs> We have been going over the feasts of the Lord. In God's Bible, in the early part of God's Bible, he laid out seven holidays, seven special feast days that he told his people he wanted them to celebrate every single year in perpetuity, every single year, to remember these seven feasts. Why are they in there? And what does that got to do with you or I? Now, most Christians divide the Bible into two parts, called the Old Testament and New Testament. And the Old Testament, most Christians are not aware of. They don't spend a lot of time reading the Old Testament because that has to do with a covenant God made with a special nation of people called the Israelites or today we call them the Jewish people. And 99.99% .99 of us are not Jewish. So we'd say, well, what's that got to do with me? Well, we think it has nothing to do with us. And so we tend to concentrate on the New Testament, the story of the birth and life, ministry, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and the beginning of what we, we know as the church. So why study these old seven holidays? These seven feasts of the Lord tell a story. Okay, Collectively, they tell a story. And I've told you before, and I'm going to reiterate over and over and over again, you all need to read the entire Bible, starting with Genesis and going forward. You need to be familiar completely with all of the stories, because it all has to do with God. It all has to do with God's Son, Jesus, and somewhere in every one of those stories is you. And it's your job, and it's my job, to figure out what God is trying to teach us in these stories. And that includes the seven feasts, or holidays, that God set up for the people of Israel, because it has big, big, Big time news for you and I. Now, again, they, they collectively tell a story. The seven feasts of the Lord, brothers and sisters, are seven prophetic snapshots, if you will, of Jesus' first coming and his second coming. I've showed you this graphic before, but I'm going to show it to you again. I want you to look at the, there are the seven holidays. You'll notice they're broken into two sections. There's a section on your left and a section on your right. The section on your left are the spring holidays or the spring feasts. There were four of them. Those happen to, to correlate with Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago. And as we went through these spring feasts, I point out to you that Jesus fulfilled those spring feasts perfectly and to the day when he was here 2,000 years ago, he fulfilled those prophetic snapshots, if you will. Those on the right that occur in the fall have to do with Jesus' second coming. You see, this is something that you and I learned that the people of Israel today still do not see or understand. And that is that the Savior, the Anointed One, the Moshiach, or the Messiah, the Christ, as it is in Greek, was to come twice. The Son of God was to come the first time as the Lamb of God, who would be slain for the sins of the world. He was the meek one, the humble one, who came on a donkey, and who submitted himself to mankind, and who was put to death for our sins. He died was entombed, rose on the third day, 50 days later he sent his Holy Spirit. He has since ascended back into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he is waiting for the Father to tell him to come back. When he comes back, he is not coming back as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's going to put down all human rebellion, all death, all disease, all sorrow, all everything. No more death. No more whatever. He's going to finally establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so those seven feasts that are laid out in Leviticus chapter 23, and, and this actually started in Exodus and go forward, but if you want one location, Leviticus chapter 23, those seven ho holidays give us two pictures, two snapshots of Jesus' first coming and his second coming. That's why they're so important. That's why we need to read them very carefully. That's why we need to chew on them and think about them. Okay, do you all get that picture? His first coming, his second coming. He fulfilled the spring feasts to the day. If you look on the left, the first was Passover. Jesus was crucified on Passover. The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world is how John the Baptist described Jesus. The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. On Passover, they were to kill a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. You remember the story in the book of Exodus. And the angel of death, the angel of judgment, would pass over your house when he saw the blood on the doorposts and the lintel, the top piece of the door. The angel of death would pass over your house and your family. But if the angel of death did not see the blood of the lamb, he would enter into that house and the firstborn, every firstborn in that house would die. See, that's Passover. Well, Jesus was put to death. He was crucified. He hung on a cross on the Passover. The next day, they laid him in the tomb. The third day, he arose again, as Paul tells us in the letter to the Corinthians. It says that Jesus was raised on the third day, and then Paul goes on to say he was the first fruits of those who have died. And see, that, that's a strange way to put it. Why did Paul say that he was the first fruit because Jesus rose on the feast of first fruits. You see, so he fulfilled those exactly to the day. And on the 50th day after Passover, which was called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men, is what both the book of Psalms says and Paul quotes. And so to the day exactly, the Son of God fulfilled the spring feasts. When he comes back, he's going to fulfill those three fall feasts. Now, we've talked about the Feast of Trumpets. And I will again, I'll quote to you from 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says that, uh, For the Lord shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are surviving and living here will rise to be with the Lord forever. Then in 1 Corinthians, Paul adds a little further clue. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. This is what Paul says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We're not all going to die. But we are all going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And here's the key. At the last trumpet. See, in 1 Thessalonians, he mentions the trumpet of God. But here in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, he says, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, we shall all be changed. That's what Paul wrote. At what trumpet? The last trumpet. So I asked you all a question when we went over the Feast of Trumpets. Where do you think the last trumpet is mentioned in the Bible? Revelations. In the last book of the Bible. Well, so. Right? The book of Revelation. And here's the interesting thing about the book of Revelation. There are seven trumpets mentioned in the book of Revelation. And to seven angels were given seven trumpets, John wrote. Now we're going to be changed at what trumpet? The last trumpet. And so you have to put all these scriptures together and you start getting a picture. And so the first trumpet sounded and something happens here on earth. Are we changed? No. Are we with the Lord? No. no. And then the second trumpet, the second angel sounds his trumpet and something happens here on earth. And where are we? We're still here. 
And the third angel sounds, and something happens here on earth, and we're still here. And so on until finally we get to the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, and that angel sounds and it says, ah, the kingdoms of men have now become the kingdom of the Lord. God has finally taken over everything. No more rebellion. Ah, that's when we're changed. That's when the dead in Christ are raised. That's when we get our brand new young immortal bodies at the seventh trumpet. So when he comes back, there's going to be a series of trumpets sounded in heaven. And to answer a potential question you might have, will we here on earth hear those trumpets? I have no idea. I do know this, that when God the Father tells the first angel to sound, Things are going to be popping here on earth. And when he tells the second angel to sound, things are going to be popping here on earth, and so on and so forth. We'll see that. We're going to see things happening here on earth. I think it would behoove you and I to read about those trumpets to find out what we should be watching for, don't you? But my whole point of this was it's going to happen at what time of the year? In the fall. In the fall. September, October, maybe. And then the second of the fall feast, Yom Kippur, I talked about last week. Yom, Hebrew for days. Kippur, atonement, or the day of covering. Payday for sins. Atonement means payment for suffering or payment for a wrong or an injury. So Yom Kippur is the day that God says, okay, it's payday for sin. You and I don't have to worry about that day. Why do we not have to worry about that day? Because Jesus paid for our sins already. We've had our payday. He hung on that cross and died for dogs and sins. And if you're a Christian, he hung on that cross and died a horrible death for your sins. So we've, we've had our payday. But see, the rest of the world, beloved, this is the truth. Whether you like it or not, the rest of the world's going around, directly or indirectly, shaking their fist at God, saying, we do not want you to rule over us. We don't need you. We can do it on our own. So God has said, okay, let's see how well that works out. And we have 6,000 years of recorded human history written down. How's it worked out for the human race? Well, Wars, rumors of wars, death, disease, sorrow, man hating man for every reason. None of that. that doesn't sound like it doesn't sound too happy to you. It doesn't look like the human race has done such a good job. But there are still men and women who shake their fist to God saying, We don't need you. So God says, Well, for now, that's okay. But you see, in God's timetable, He says, There is an end to that. There's going to come a time when I say, Enough. I've proven my point that the humans without me will not and cannot survive. If I left the human race to itself, God says, the human race would destroy itself. If you doubt that, then go back and read what Jesus said. If the Son of Man did not cut short the days of his return, no flesh would survive, is what Jesus said. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. If the Son of Man did not cut short those days, no flesh would survive. The human race is capable of destroying itself. And it is capable now, thanks to nuclear weapons and whatnot, the human race is capable of wiping out all life on this planet. But God says, no, it's not my plan. I will let the human race go to a certain point and no flesh. And then I send my son back. And he's going to clean up this system. When does it start? In the fall of the year. But after the seventh trumpet sounds, it's going to be a payday for sin. And for all the rebellion, for everybody who shook their fist at God and said, we will not have you rule over us, God will say, too bad, so sad. I am going to demand payment for every sin. That is going to be a very, very somber day day of judgment. But you and I don't have to worry about that because we want to pass our day of judgment 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on that cross. Today, we're going to talk about the last, the seventh feast. The feast of Tabernacles. The greatest feast. 
Now, you see that word tabernacle? That's a big long word that simply means a tent. A temporary dwelling structure. Okay, that's what a tabernacle is and was. A tent, a temporary place of living. Something that you put out in the desert, you lived in, and you picked up, you rolled up, and then you moved to another place. You know, like the Bedouins in the Middle East. Or the American Indians out west. You know, they picked up their teepees, they moved from place to place. Well, that's a tabernacle, a tent. I showed you this picture before. After 400 years of slavery, God sent Moses to the people of Israel to redeem them out of slavery of Egypt, to bring them out of the bondage of slavery. They left Egypt, they went into the desert of Sinai, and there God told Moses, tell the people to build a tabernacle, a tent, and I will dwell in the midst of the people. And so they built this tent for God in the desert. And you'll see that there's a big linen wall around it. No Gentiles could go past that wall. And so everything about that tabernacle or tent had a specific meaning. And it all has to do with Jesus. There was, as I mentioned before, there was a big broad square altar as you walk through the front gate of that tabernacle area, there was a big bronze altar. And there, if you screwed up, if you broke one of God's commandments, you would bring a sheep. I'm just going to use it. It could have been as big as a calf or as small as a pair of tentacle nuts. But the average person would bring a sheep to the priest. They would slice the throat of the sheep for that person's sin. And then the priest would put the contents of that sheep on the bronze altar and burn it up as a sin offering. And then afterwards, the next thing, the priest would walk down the steps of that big altar and he'd go to this big round, it looked like a big bird bath, if you can see it up there. And it was a basin called a laver. It was filled with water. And there the, the priest would wash himself off. Then he would go into that tent that tent had two rooms. The first room that you entered was called the holy place. And it had three items in it. It had a large candelabra called a menorah. It looked like this, but it was about five feet tall. Okay? And it had oil, olive oil at the top of it. And the, the priest would make sure that, that each little basin that had the olive oil was filled because that candelabra, that menorah, had to be burning continually. And so part of the priest's duty was when he entered in, is to make sure there's oil for the light. And as I've mentioned before, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So it, that had to do with Jesus. And then straight back from the doorway, with the candelabra on the left, straight back was another altar, but it was covered in pure gold. And the priest would go and he would take a, a little scooper and he would scoop up some incense and it had coals in that altar and he would pour incense on the coals and that would produce a very beautiful fragrant scent a frankincense another mixture of, of scents and it would rise up and that represented the, the prayers of the saints candelabra i am the light of the world the prayers of the saints and then over on the right was a table Sort of like the altar table up there. And on that table were 12 loaves of bread. One loaf for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the priest would change out those 12 loaves every day. And you remember Jesus said, I'm the bread of life? It all has to do with Jesus. But once a year, and only once a year, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest, the highest of the priests of the priestly family, the high priest would walk beyond the curtain and he would walk into the back room, which was called the Holy of Holies. And in that back room there was only one article, a chest covered in gold called the Ark of the Covenant. 
And inside that chest was the stone tablets that Moses had brought down from the mountain. And on top of the chest was a seat called the mercy seat, with a couple of angels with their wings outspread over that mercy seat. And God had told Moses, I will meet you there. And I will speak with you face to face there. So God would, if you can picture this, sit on the mercy seat and talk with Moses. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. That, all of that I just described to you, was part of the tabernacle that God told Moses to tell the people to build. It was a temporary dwelling. Now, they would pick up that tent. There would be a, during the day, there would be a pillar of smoke coming up from the back of that tent. And that pillar of smoke would be, a, think of a mushroom cloud, like a nuclear mushroom cloud. It would come up as smoke and then fan out this way and it would cover the entire area of where the Israelites were in the desert. Because they're out in the Sinai Desert, the Saudi Arabian Desert, where it gets up to be 140 or higher during the summertime. And so this cloud would cover them, from keep the people from baking, if you will, year round. And then at night, at night, there would be a pillar of fire that would come up from the back, and it would come out like a mushroom cloud, and it would provide light over the entire encampment during the night. And if you look carefully there, hopefully you can see it, you can see all the tents of the 12 tribes around the tabernacle. Can you all see that? Now to give you some idea, <clears throat> there were roughly 2 million people walking through that desert. There were 12 tribes. There were three tribes on each of the four sides, north, south, east, and west. There were over 600,000 fighting men, ages 20 and up, able to go to war because God told Moses to take a census of the people. So he took a census of the fighting men. And so we know that there were over 600,000 fighting men of 20 years of age and older. That means that there were probably 600,000 women of age 20 and older. But then you've got the people who were too old to go out to fight, and then you've got the young people under 20 and so on. And so roughly 2 million people were following that tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, let's fast forward several hundred years. When the people finally get into the Promised Land, God has them build a permanent structure called the temple. This was made of stone. This was not made of fabric. And this here is a recreation built to scale. And I don't know if you can see on it, but there's a lot of little dots. You see all the little dots? Those are people. That area there at the top of Mount Zion had been leveled by King Herod. Josephus writes about it in his secular history books. King Herod had leveled off the entire top of Mount Zion, and it could hold somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people during those feast days. That's how big that area was. The temple area itself was over a football field in length. Okay? Same basic dimensions as the tabernacle, except bigger. Everything was bigger. But it was made of stone, and it didn't move. It was permanent. What's that got to do with you and I? You see, all of the story in the Old Testament, all of this, from Genesis forward, has to do with a tent in the wilderness to a temple on the top of Mount Zion. They both represent the place where God would dwell. And it all has to do with you and I. We have a body here on earth that's a temporary dwelling place. But we also are going to have a body when the Lord comes back that's going to be permanent. So this long description that the Old Testament has about the tabernacle in the wilderness has something to do with us. And the, the t temple that Solomon built and then later on King Herod rebuilt all has something to do with us. God is trying to tell us something here. 
So we're talking about tabernacles. Now if you read the word tabernacles in the original Hebrew or Greek, you'll find that the word tabernacles occurs over and over in different contexts. You should really study this. It's really cool. So, for example, I'm going to give you just a few examples. John 1.1, 1, 1, the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's how John 1.1 1, 1 starts out. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. God. The entire purpose of the Gospel of John, the reason he wrote it, was to show us that Jesus is God come in the flesh. Matthew was to show that Jesus was the King of Judah, the son of David who was prophesied to come, that Jesus was the promised anointed one. Mark wrote his gospel to show that not only was Jesus a king, as Matthew said, but he was also servant. King, servant. King, slave. High, low. You see the pairing? Luke wrote to show that even though Jesus is the Son of God, he was completely human. And so Luke gives us a very detailed story of Jesus' birth to Mary. And it goes on and on. Very much human. And then, of course, John, the fourth gospel, where he's not only a man, he's God. So, king, slave, man, God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You all get the pictures? Two pairs. John starts off, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you get to verse 14, and it says, and the Word became, what? Flesh. Flesh. And tabernacled tabernacle among us. What a strange thing for John to write. Why did he write that? Well, your translations, if you have the New King James, or you have the Old King James, or you have the NIV, or you have the New American Standard, or even the ESV, most modern translations will say, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, okay, I, I, that's an acceptable translation. But the word John used was tabernacle. Why did John pick that word? Because he was trying to tell us something. The word became flesh, he's talking about Jesus, and the word became flesh and tabernacle among us. He temporarily dwelt among us in a tabernacle, if you will. Here's another example of that word. I love this. It's in multiple Gospels. You can read it in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a mountain one day to pray. So Peter, James, and John go up to the top of this mountain, and Jesus goes apart and starts praying. And Peter, James, and John, they get a little drowsy. I mean, Jesus is all praying, and they get a little tired, and, and suddenly something changes. Suddenly it becomes very bright. And, and Luke writes, and Jesus' appearance changed. His clothes became whiter than white, like lightning white. And suddenly, Peter, James, and John are not alone with Jesus. Jesus is standing there. He's standing there with Moses and with Elijah. And Jesus and Moses and Elijah are talking together. And they're shining with glory. And Peter, James, and John are freaking out. Here's Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. And they're all glowing. And Peter's freaking out. And we read this. Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three, three what? Tabernacles. Let's put up three tabernacles. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then Luke adds, Peter didn't have a clue what he was saying. He's so freaked out. 
He says, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three tabs. Why would he say that? Why would Peter say, we need to put up three tabernacles? And Peter didn't even know what he was saying. I'll tell you why. Because Peter was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was trying to tell you and I something. Tabernacles. I put up three tabernacles. And, and here's another question. I'll ask you. For all of you together, I assume that all of you read, read these parts of the Bible. Can anybody here give me a description of Moses? I heard the answer. What was the answer? Why not? There's no description of Moses given. What did he look like? Moses had been dead for 1,500 years. There is no description of Moses given in the Bible. And yet Peter, James, and John recognized Jesus talking with Moses. How did they know it was Moses? And then there's Elijah. Elijah had been dead for 700 years. Hey, I got the news for y'all, you younger people. There were no cell phones back then. No selfies. We had no pictures, no drawings, no descriptions of Moses and Elijah. And yet Peter, James, and John knew it was Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because when I get to heaven, I am going to meet a good-looking young woman whose name is Chris. And she's going to have... Blonde. She's going to have blonde hair. <laughs> How am I going to know it's Chris? I'm going to meet a young guy who is glowing and who is healthy. I'm just radiating youth and health. Then I'm going to walk up to him and say, Hey, Tony! How am I going to know it's Tony? See, we're going to know one another. And you're going to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You'll recognize whoever, even if you've never seen a picture of him or her. What did Abraham's wife Sarah look like? Huh? She was good looking. I know that because it says she was good looking. I mean, the Pharaoh of Egypt took a liking to her. But I mean, what did she look like? And yet you and I already know Sarah when we see her. Well, when Peter, James, and John saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, they recognized him. So that in itself, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. But, but even more awesome is the fact that here's Peter, not knowing what he's saying, saying, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let, let's put up three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses, one for Elijah. Tabernacles. Because he was seeing Jesus, Moses, and Elijah in their glorified state. He was seeing Jesus and Moses and Elijah, as we'll all see them someday, when? At the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he said what he said. Isn't that awesome? Boy, that Feast of Tabernacles must really be awesome. Yeah, it is. Now, there's another note regarding the word tabernacles. Our bodies are called tabernacles in Scripture. Our bodies are called tents or tabernacles. Same word, tabernacles, in Scripture. Paul wrote this, 2 Corinthians. Paul said, Now we know that if the earthly tabernacle we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. And then Paul goes on to say, we long to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And see, here's the interesting thing. Paul says, let me go back and read it again. Now we know, what do we know? That if the, and this is the words that Paul wrote in the original, if the earthly tabernacle we live in is destroyed, 
What's he talking about? Paul says, now we know this. We, we understand this. You all need to understand this. We, we already know what Paul says. That if our earthly bodies are destroyed, this tabernacle, this temporary dwelling structure that we live in is destroyed, it's okay. Because we have an eternal building from God. Something not built with human hands. God has created a body for each of you that is going to be you, the perfect you. Jody is going to look like Jody without any of the corrupt DNA that Jody inherited from her parents and her grandparents and great grandparents. And each and every one of you is going to look like you, but without the corrupted DNA. God's got your original DNA on the file of heaven. How's that? And so when he creates a body for you, it's going to be permanent, eternal, young, not capable of aging, not capable of getting disease, not capable of corruption. Is that not exciting? Yes. I mean, wow. And then Paul said, as I read, I'll read it again, we long, we desire to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Different word. Different word. With our heavenly building. This is what Paul said. This is what we long for. To have our heavenly body, not this old, decaying, <coughs> earthly body. So, the seven feasts brought tabernacles. This year, this year, the Feast of Tabernacles starts when? Tomorrow in Jerusalem. Tomorrow evening, September 20th, starts the Feast of Tabernacles. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus came back tomorrow for us? No? Please, I can't take the enthusiasm. <laughs> My heart just can't take it. Let me ask you again. Wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus came back tomorrow for us? Yes. yes. I mean, when you young people saying, yeah, not so much. But for those of us over 30, we're starting to feel it, huh? Yeah, I'm, I don't know about you all, but I'm so looking forward to the lion and the lamb dwelling together. No more cancer, no more disease, no more... Boy, boy, boy. Now this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, in the nation of Israel today, they call it the Feast of Booths. Same word. Or, if you want the actual Hebrew word, tomorrow evening starts the Feast of Sukkot. That's plural. The O-T at the end of that is masculine plural. The, the singular form of the Hebrew word is sukkah. Sukkah. And it means booth. So Sukkot means booths, plural. Feast of Booths. It's also called the Feast of Ingathering. Oh, I love it. Boy, this doesn't do it too. The Feast of Ingathering. This is the time of the year when the crops are gathered in. How many stories do you think Jesus told about farmers and harvests and fishermen gathering in fish? Remember that? Fishman went out to fish, and he gathered up a great number of fish. And they pulled it on the shore. And the fishermen then took the good fish and saved them. And what did he do with the bad fish? He tossed them. The farmer went out to farm. And the servants came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in the field? And he said, Yes, I did. Well, there's a bunch of weeds in the field, too. Remember that parable? Should we go and tear up the, the weeds? The master says, no, let them grow till the harvest. And then we'll gather up the weeds together. And we'll bear them. And we'll gather the wheat together in bundles and harvest them. The Feast of Ingathering. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. When the Lord's going to gather all his sons and daughters together. And it's going to be a party. It's also called, to the Jewish people, 
the season of our joy. Or when you read the scripture sometimes, it's simply called the feast. So we read about Jesus going up to the feast. And people say, well, what feast? Was it the feast of Passover? The feast of unleavened bread? Was it the feast of fruit? No, it was the feast is tabernacles. <clears throat> Here's what it says back in Leviticus. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have done what? You've done what? And who's the crops for God? Huh? Yeah. On the 15th of the seventh month, when God has gathered in his crops, you shall celebrate before Yahweh for seven days with the rest on the first day and the rest on the eighth day. On the first day, you are to take choice fruit from the trees. And now notice this. What do I have underlined? Palm branches. Palm branches and poplars and rejoice before the Lord. Moses will write even further there, and he'll say, you are to gather these palm branches and these poplars and other branches and leafy trees near to build booths in the desert. And then you're to live in the booths for seven days and celebrate to God. It's the Feast of Ingathering. Now, there's a strange story in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, about Jesus and his brothers coming to him. John, chapter 7, and his brothers urge him, it's, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. So they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you should go up to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles because anybody who wants to make a name for himself, you know, they've got to go to Jerusalem. You don't do your miracles in secret, you do them publicly. And then John writes, because even his brothers at this point did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But Jesus turns to them and he says this, My time is not yet at hand. He told his brothers, you go up to the feast. It's not my time yet. My time's not at hand. And yet we read in the seventh chapter of John, and yet after they left, Jesus did go up to the feast, but secretly. So why, why did he say that? Why did Jesus say, my time's not at hand? Because the Lord was looking forward to the actual Feast of Tabernacles someday when He gets together with all of us. That great feast day when New Jerusalem comes out of heaven and we get to all party together. So that, that Feast of Tabernacles that year was not Jesus' time. He did go up to the feast because it was required of every Jewish male to go to that feast. So he did go up, but he went up secretly. But when he says, my time's not at hand, it's because he was looking forward to the day when he gets to greet and hug each one of us. Is that going to be cool? The great feast day. Now, in Jesus' day, there was a ritual that the high priest would do. The high priest would go down to the pool of Siloam and he would take a pitcher and he would draw water from the pool of Siloam and he would take it back to the temple area and he would pour the water out and as he poured the water out he would pray a ritual prayer and he would say, Lord, send your Holy Spirit now. Send your spirit now. Now the reason I'm telling you all this is because when you read in the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, you read some of the things that Jesus said and did. If you don't know the context, you won't get the meaning. So we go back to John chapter 7, and we read this. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Why did he say that? Why did he say that on the last day of the great feast? Well, that was the day that the high priest was pouring water out of the temple area saying, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
And then John goes on to say, and when Jesus said this, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, which had not been poured out yet because Jesus had not been raised from the dead. See, if any man is thirsty, let him come to who? Me, Jesus said, let him drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. In the future, future tabernacles, the future ingathering, it all has to do with, are you ready for this? The wedding feast. That's what the book of Revelation calls it. The wedding feast. The Apostle John wrote this, Revelation chapter 19. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with what in their hands? Does that sound familiar? Remember, we were together in palm branches for the Feast of Tabernacles. And here are all these people standing before the throne of God. Standing for the Lamb of God. And what do we have in our hands? Palm branches. Well, let's go on and read. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And His bride has made herself ready. Who's the bride of the Lamb? Who's the bride of Jesus? Us. The church. And the bride has made herself ready. Oh, aren't you looking forward to that day? Right. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, here it is. The what? The tabernacle of God is among men. But then read. And he. Let me go back. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he. He will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Who's he talking about there? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And then in the book of Revelation, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them. And they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. Ah, oh, no, now we get into the cool stuff. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer be any what? Yes. No longer there'll be any death. No longer. It's done away with. There will no longer be any mourning, a sadness, or crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. All that stuff is gone. Aren't you glad? And he who sits on the throne said, Listen, yo, I'm making all things new. Barbara, you're getting a brand new young body, sister. Is that not awesome? Is that the way it's in the fall. In the fall, in the fall. Yeah. How come it says palm branches? Because that's an Easter. That's what? That's an Easter. Well, we think about it with Easter. Yeah. But it's also with the Lord returning. Is that not awesome? I was trying to think. He's coming back at Easter? No, he's coming back in the fall. That's it. He's coming back in the fall. 
Honey, can you, can you all, yo, I want you guys all to look back at that young guy back there with the, with the dark beard. Can you imagine him, can you imagine him with the dark brown beard, uh, strutting his young stuff? I mean, Nicholas is going to look at him and say, whoa, I don't know if I can take him now or not. <laughs> I mean, isn't that good? Aren't you, don't you guys get excited when you think about these things? Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, write. For these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it's done. You see, God's plan has been written out by God since before the creation of the universe. And from God's perspective, it's all done, people. As we march through time, God's movie picture is being played out. You have your part in it, I have my part in it, but it's God's movie picture. He's the director and he's the producer. And as far as God's concerned, the movie's finished. It's all done. Isn't that amazing? Wow. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. There's that spring again that Jesus talked about. And I'm going to leave you with what we read in today's Bible verse to remember. From the very last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Jesus says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. And then John says, truly, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Isn't that what we should be saying? Oh, Lord, come quickly. Come soon. Because we are so tired of death and hatred and disease and poverty and anger and all these bad things. Yes? Lord, come quickly and put an end to all that. Well, he is coming soon. And when he comes, So, do you see why I get excited every fall of the year? Does this make sense? Every fall of the year, I wait and say, oh, could it be this year? Well, it be this year. It could be this year. And if he doesn't come back this year, then we start to cycle over again and we wait. But he is coming back. And he's, as he said, he's coming back soon. Now, there will be those among us who will say, well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus came. Remember what Peter said? <coughs> Listen, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. A thousand years is like a day. A day. So if it's been two thousand years from our perspective, how long has it been from Jesus' perspective? A couple of days. <laughs> two days. The prophet Hosea said, after two days, I will raise you up. After two days, I will revive you, the Lord says. Then the third day, I will raise you up. It's been over two days now, hasn't it? Yes. So we are now starting the third day since Jesus was here. Yeah, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. What year is this? 2021. 1,000 years, 2,000 years, and now we're 21 years into the third day, aren't we? After two days, I'm going to revive you. After two days, the Lord says. In the third day, I'm going to raise you up. Don't you think we should start getting excited? Yeah. Okay, stand up. I'm telling you, Doris, the enthusiasm sometimes just makes the heart beat. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I, I, I do thank you for the brothers and sisters here. And I lift each and every family before you, Lord, one by one by one. And I ask, Father, that you bless every family that is represented, whether a single individual 
or husband or wife, or husband and wife and children, whatever, whatever the combination is, Father, I ask that you bless every household that is represented here in the sanctuary this morning, and those who are watching. Lord, watch over your sons and daughters. Bless us, keep us as the apple of your eye, encourage us by your Holy Spirit, and help us while we're still here to walk more like your son Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.